Okay, good morning. So I'm going to start the unit on convolutional and deep neural networks. And this one will take us a little bit longer than some of the other ones. We have a lot to talk about. Okay, so we're going to start talking about um, data sets, actually. So if you look at what was happening uh, before about 2009, most of the data sets used um, for, for image recognition, like image classification, things like that, were relatively small by today's standards. So a few of them would be MNIST, which we know about, that has 70,000 examples, 10 classes, 28 by 28 images. Another one from those days, Pascal VOC, 11,000 examples, 20 classes, variable size images, but not so different from MNIST. And then CIFR 10, 60,000 examples, 10 classes, 32 by 32 images. This is an example of uh, CIFR 10. It's, it's 10 because there's 10 classes. There's also a CIFR 100 that has 100 classes. And then these are just a few examples of the 60,000. And you can see when you have images of size 32 by 32, they are very low resolution. You can barely tell what's, what's happening in these images, but it's, it's just enough. And these are still used today um, if you want to try something relatively simple that doesn't take forever. Um, CIFR 10 is, is definitely still popular. <clears throat> But around that time, people had the idea that in order to develop better algorithms and better methods, you need more data. And actually, this was kind of a controversial idea at the time, because already at that time, in some sense, they were struggling to keep up with the data sets that they had, because if you have you know, tens of thousands of examples and even though these images are small, they contain roughly um, 1,000 pixels per image. You know, processing them is non-trivial, especially on the hardware of those days. So when someone said, we need much bigger data sets, other people said, well, isn't that kind of crazy? The data sets we have are already giant. But it was true. Um, in order to really make that leap to the next level, we do need bigger data sets. As we know, you know, part of that is due to the um, <clears throat> bias variance trade-off. Like if you, if you try to build a larger model and you don't have enough data, the variance kills you. But the way that you can overcome that is you collect a lot more data. Okay, so this was um, the first data set that really tried to do this was ImageNet. It's now very famous data set, still used extensively. And the goal at the time was essentially to map out the entire world of objects. Sounds very ambitious, and it was. Um, and the way they eventually did it was they collected 3.2 million images and more than 5,000 classes. And the way they set out even to organize all these different objects was inspired by an earlier um, data set that was uh, collected in the, from the linguistics side where people said, let's, um, for English, let's, let's come up with a hierarchical way of organizing all the words, all, all common words. And um, this kind of hierarchical idea was also used in ImageNet. So for example, here are a couple examples of what we mean by the hierarchical approach. So you have a class of mammals that in class includes several subclasses, one of which is placental mammals, which has several subclasses, one of which is carnivores, and that has subclasses, one of which is canines. One of the subclasses of that is dog, one of the subclasses of that is working dog, and one of the subclasses of that is husky. So as you see, we're getting very, very specific. 
and um, and then another one vehicle craft watercraft sailing vessel sailboat trimaran <clears throat> so so that's what ImageNet did and another non-trivial thing to do if you think about it you know there's a lot of images available on the internet it's very easy to find images but to find labeled images is a different story especially at the time back in 2009 so so they collected these images but then they um they needed people to do the work of labeling them to say you know that this image is a mammal or placental mammal or whatever so they um they used something called amazon's mechanical turk which is a system where you can farm out little jobs to random people on the internet that will do them for a very little bit of pay. So they will be given a bunch of images, and in this case, they needed to just type what they thought was in the image, and maybe they would receive, you know, a cent or something for doing that. So they could, on their free time, they could uh, do this. And in that way, this uh, this research group that didn't have, you know, a huge amount of money, they were able to label these 3.2 million images into um, 5,000 classes. So 5,000 classes, those are not, those are the classes? The those would be probably the, the, the end ones. Okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and so, so there's, there, this is a great article about it, um, and, but the, the work was finally described formally in this paper uh, from 2009. <clears throat> So in addition to, or after they collected that data set, there was a very famous competition that was held yearly from 2010 to 2017, which was to see how well people could do working with that data set. And every year they had it, they had different competitions. And so in, in 2012, for example, they had a competition on image classification where they, uh, they used images from a thousand classes, and then the goal was, or, or the, what you had to do is you had to build a classifier that would list the five most likely classes per image. And um, I think uh, probably it was a ranked, you know, so, um, so even within there, you could make a couple different uh, competitions. You know, one competition could be, is your most, is your top ranked pick correct, or is one of your top five correct? Another competition they had was fine-grained classification, where they looked specifically at 120 different categories of dogs. So that's, you know, that's going to be more challenging to be able to distinguish different types of dogs from each other than, you know, a leopard and a, and a, and a car or something. And they had another um, competition, which was classification with localization, which would say, not only should you tell me what's in the image, but tell me, give me a bounding box to tell me where, where it exists. So maybe you might be like, okay, there's a dog here, or there's a mushroom here, something like that. Um, and actually, in this case, the goal is to list the five most likely things in an image with bounding boxes. <clears throat> so um, if you think about it, this is all pretty challenging because when you look at an image, um, the, there could be many objects in the image, number one. Number two, those objects can be of different sizes. They could be rotated. They could uh, be illuminated using different lighting. And they could be partially hidden. They could be occluded. So, like, if you look at this, this picture here, which is labeled as motor scooter, it's actually kind of challenging. Uh, the motor scooter is, is quite dark, um, and there's people in it, there's cars, there's signs. You know, there's a lot of other stuff going on in there, um, and so on. So, and, for example, if you look at this picture, this one was actually categorized as grill, not, not car. So that's maybe kind of surprising. And then this one, 
<coughs> was categorized as cherry and not dog. So, and what we see on the bottom are um, for one of the classifiers, these are the, the top five uh, classes that it was predicting. And then this is also the, um, you can see with the size of the bar, the confidence in that particular class. So this classifier thought, I'm very confident this is a Dalmatian, but you know, with less confidence, it could be grapes or elderberries or so on and so on. Okay, so this is sort of describing what image classification is. So again, an image classification, for each image, there's only one label. Even though there might be multiple things going on, you're just approximating this whole thing by one, one label and not necessarily trying to say, you know, where that object is located unless this is, you know, kind of a different task. We're going to focus mainly just on classification. Find that one label per image. You're given a list of a thousand possible labels. So tell me which one you think is the most likely. So that's just a classification problem the way that we have always defined it in this course. Um, later on, I'll talk a little bit about some of these other problems, but for most of this unit, we're going to focus on just classification. Okay, so 2012 was the year where deep neural networks uh, entered into the ImageNet competition. And <clears throat> so here's, here's over the years, and here's the accuracy that was obtained and the blue techniques are traditional computer vision techniques. So things like, um, for example, a support vector machine, things like that. And then deep learning methods are shown here in green. So in the first year, 2010, there's no deep learning. Second year, as you can see, things got a little bit better. No deep learning yet. But in the third year, 2012, there's a big jump from the previous methods that were classical to the deep learning, a giant jump in accuracy. And then in 2013, you know, a lot of most of the other people, once they saw this, they invested their energy and, you know, the best deep learning methods got better. Um, overall, everything got a lot better and there's just still a few people working on the traditional methods. And then by 2014, nobody was working on anything but deep learning. And as you can see, performance just kept getting better and better, almost perfect by 2015, you know, 97% or whatever. So this is to try to give you a perspective of breakthrough is why, why deep networks are so important. And it's because basically around 10 years ago, it was shown that they can just outperform all these other methods that people had been developing for, for decades, really. So, yeah, so in 2012, it was this AlexNet was the top method by Hinton's group, University of Toronto. And uh, it easily won the competition. Its top five error rate was 15.3%. Second place winner is 25%. 0.6% down here. And soon all the methods were deep nets. A similar thing happened around the same time in speech. So it was in speech and image classification that this big breakthrough was made. And then in subsequent years, many, many, many other fields. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about this in later slides, but let me just show you a little bit about this network architecture of AlexNet, which was that one that, that won it in 2012. So um, <clears throat> the way that, the way to read this picture is that these, these big blue boxes, they actually show the data at different stages. So again, it's a little different than a lot of block diagrams that we're used to seeing in electrical engineering where the boxes show the, the functions or the system these are actually showing the data, and actually those red triangles or red pyramids here, these are, the, these are showing us um, the convolution. So let's just start at the beginning. So this ImageNet database, 
has images of size 224 by 224, and they're color images. So each image is represented by three uh, brightness uh, images, one red, one green, one blue. So altogether, a single color image, you could say, is a, what we would call a tensor that has dimensions 224, 224, and 3. So we can describe that using this uh, little cube is not the word, but you know it's, it's a little, uh, little kind of rectangular volume. OK, so what happens in, <clears throat> as you can see, there's, there's transformations to different sizes as you go down the network. And at the end, because this is doing a thousand way classification, we know that we have to have a thousand eventually. So at the end, this is just a, a thousand by one vector. And the values in there, if they're, um, so one option is, is to just think of them as real numbers, where the larger they are, the more confident you are in that class. Or you could put those real numbers through a softmax, and you could turn them into probabilities that are between 0 and 1. And then that gives you confidence in a slightly more interpretable scale. <coughs> But overall, what the deep network does is it gradually transforms this thing that's from the pixel domain to something over here, which is really in the class domain. And it just gradually does that by decreasing the size spatially. As you can see, it becomes 55 by 55, then 27 by 27, then 13 by 13, so on. But then it keeps increasing the number of what we call channels. Um, in, this, in this volume. So we go from 2 to 96 to 256. If you want to think about them as colors, you can. It's almost like from this original three color image, now you make a new image that has spatial coordinates, but also you know, 96 different colors and so on. Um, and of course, 96 colors are not interpretable to us as humans, but there are actually many creatures out there that see in many more than three colors. And the, uh, the neural network here eventually learns you know, to interpret all these different um, channels, is what we usually call them. So, so what we're, what we're going to have finally is when we go from one to the next, we're going to have the standard combination of some linear transform followed by a simple element-wise nonlinearity. It may not be a sigmoid. It might be instead a ReLU. And that was actually what was used, uh, I think, maybe even for the first time in this network. So the linear transform is not just a matrix multiply. Because if you think about it, a matrix multiply would be too big. The total number of pixels we have here is 224 squared. That's a big number. And over here, it's 55 squared. That's a big number, too. So the, the size of the matrix you would need if you just did a matrix multiply would be 224 squared by 55 squared. And the, the number of elements in that matrix would be you know, this times this. That's just some absolutely giant number. There's no way to do that. So we'd like to do a linear transform, but we'd like to do it in a more structured way that involves many fewer parameters to learn and many fewer multiplications to implement. And that's what convolution will do for us. We'll talk in detail about convolution in later slides. But essentially, what the convolution is doing is it's like sliding this little template around the Im image. And, um, and then at every shift, it's making, uh, it's saying how strong is the pattern there and it's mapping that to just one number. So as it moves its template around, it's filling out um, all these different pixels in this new domain. And in fact, there's not just one template. You have, um, for every combination of input and output channel, you will have a different template that you learn and then eventually you apply. So that's, that's what's happening in these convolution layers. And like I said, we'll talk about them in great detail later. Um, <clears throat> once you get to the end of the network, 
what you do is there's what's called a flattening layer. All you do is you just vectorize this whole thing, just make it a string of numbers. And essentially that's what's gonna give you this. And then when you're in this part of the network, you're just, you're doing something with straightforward matrix multiplies, but now they're 4096 by 4096. So it's still big, but it's doable. And, um, and so this part actually looks just like what we did in the last unit. But what's here that's new, one thing that's new is the convolutional layers. And there are a few other tricks that we will learn about later, something called max pooling and dropout. And this max pooling is actually part of what's used to reduce the dimension uh, spatially when you go from one of these layers to the next. So a bunch of new tricks were introduced that really broke through a lot of the issues that people had with these because, you know, these neural networks were definitely not new at the time. They were, people were looking at these in the 90s quite intensely, but then they just kind of saturated, they got stuck. And so it required some new breakthroughs in this two, 2012 uh, time frame. And that's what really started everything in this latest wave. So when you look at all the different tunable parameters here, you have 60 million of them. That's quite a lot. And if you count all the number of uh, features in all these different layers, there's 650,000. So it's quite, um, quite a lot. So especially at the time, that was quite intense. So implementing this was, uh, you know, probably the biggest, one of the biggest issues is how do you actually implement this on the hardware at the time. And, you know, that's all part of the contribution that was made. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into a lot of these details in later slides, but just to give you kind of a, an idea of, of what, what kind of broke this, this stagnation. Right. Any questions so far? Okay, so <clears throat> let's, let's also try now to understand a little bit about what we get from having many more than two layers. Why, why do we need deep layers or deep networks? So let's go back to what we learned in the last unit. And actually, let's just think about what happens in the first layer of a two-layer network. So as we know, the first thing we do is we compute, um, we take our input features, we have some weights, bias, we compute our scores, and then we put those scores through an activation function, like a sigmoid, and we get this activation. And um, so and here's, here's our sigmoid. So we already saw this when we studied logistic regression. But what this does is here we're plotting A versus x1 and x2. And we see here's this linear boundary, which we, we learned about in, when we studied logistic regression. We also know that as, as a linear classifier, the, the weight vector W is orthogonal to that boundary. And the bias, or intercept B, that's, what, that's what's going to shift this, somehow shift it up, down, or left, right. And, um, but overall, what happens when you go through this first layer is that you can you can essentially say that you're taking these features and you're splitting the entire space of R2 into two half spaces. And one half space is on one side, the other half space is on the other side. In terms of the A's, if we're using the sigmoid, then one half space shows the A's that are greater than one half, the other is A's less than one half. And, um, and this is a useful building block as a way of taking the entire input and then chopping it in half. And what you, you know, by learning W and B, you can decide how you want to chop that in half. So that's what the first layer does. And the, um, the role of W here, if you think about it, um, from 
a couple different ways to think about it. <clears throat> Even from this figure here, because W is perpendicular to the decision boundary, you can see that as I go in this direction, I expect A to grow larger, right? The when I'm on the boundary, A is, um, well, let's see. So I guess Z, Z is zero on the boundary. And so if we put it through the sigmoid, then, then A is one half on the boundary. But as I go this way, anywhere in this direction, both Z and A increase. On the other hand, if I go this way, Z goes negative, A gets closer to zero, so it decreases. So it's really all about how far you are from the boundary. So we can think about that by saying um, A is largest when the input is collinear to W. You want to go in the direction of W. If you do that, you get large outputs. If you go opposite, you get small outputs. And if you go orthogonal to W, in this direction, essentially the size of your output would not change. So this is all trying to understand what is the effect of W on the output of this hidden layer, this, this first layer. It's, it's the more you are aligned with W, the larger the output. In any orthogonal moves you make with respect to W, the output doesn't change. Okay. Another way to think about it is using Cauchy-Schwartz, um, we have this relationship here that if you look at the inner product between W and X, this is bounded by the norm of the W, norm of w times norm of X, and you get an equality when X is collinear to W. <clears throat> so. so this is what happens in that first layer or in a one-layer network. Okay, what about when you add the second layer? So we basically talked about this and we saw so this is a nice illustration this is something called tensor board <clears throat> and here are inputs and let's say we were just focusing on one of these neurons here you can see the little picture from the previous page here's your decision boundary for that neuron because in going from here to here you have one set of weights and one bias now Going here to here, you have a different set of weights and a different bias, so you have a different uh, boundary and so on in each one of these cases. So each of these are splitting our space into two half spaces, but in different ways. <clears throat> now what we can do with the next layer is we can use those half spaces, and using the weights and the bias here, we can put them together constructively, and in particular, the way we said it was we're looking for intersections of these half spaces. So, you know, when are you, let's say if you said, when are you on the blue side of this, 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 and this, that would give you, um, well, actually, so, so because there's a different weight here, you know, you, you, you could weight the blue side of this negatively, the blue side of this positively, and so on. So you can, you can sort of come up with um, all different combinations of intersections of all those different half spaces. And the one that we are training the network, in this case, to learn is one that classifies these points in the middle from one class and all the points from the outside the middle from the other class. So this is, again, essentially what we saw in the last unit but here we can see that there's actually a nice visualization tool called TensorBoard that can, can help us to, to visualize this as well. So in going from one layer <coughs> where we have simple half spaces with two layers, we can get these intersections of half spaces and we can get you know, closed objects or half open objects, th things like that, but still kind of relatively simple objects on, on this side. So then, okay, what if we have a more complicated uh, set of, you know, more complicated classification problem? So unlike this problem where we had blue points in the middle, yellow points outside, now we have this, what we call the Swiss roll, that has blue points here and yellow points here. So do you think with a two-layer network, we're going to be able to 
classify this? What do you think? Probably not. At least it's going to definitely be not possible with only four neurons, right? Because, um, yeah, we just, we just don't have, you can't really make regions that are this complicated, at least with four neurons. So what's another approach? Let's add some more layers. So here we see your first layer, familiar things, half spaces. Second layer is creating, again, familiar things from those half spaces. So if you zoom in, you can see, okay, we're creating like a little dot there. In this case, we're creating something like this. This one looks like it's not really doing much. This one is so on. So again, relatively primitive shapes, but if we go one more stage and we put these primitive shapes together, we get more interesting shapes, as you can see. And then if we put those together, we can finally do a pretty good job classifying the points in the Swiss roll. Of course, like what's happening here, you can say uh, that doesn't look right, but we never gave it any training data to, to tell it really what to do here. And what it's doing is definitely consistent with the training data we gave it, so that's fine. Okay, maybe here it's consistent with the training data, but as you can see, maybe there could be a test point here that would make an error. So this is just, you know, there's gaps in our training data, so, so maybe we shouldn't expect too much. But anyway, the point here is to see that as you add more layers, you can get more and more complicated uh, decision regions, and you can accomplish more complicated tasks. Okay, but still, this is definitely a toy problem. You know, what about real problems that have much more, many more uh, features? You know, this probably has like, I don't know, maybe close to a million pixels, and maybe we're looking at thousands of classes. How do we do this? <clears throat> so essentially, we just need to keep going. We need to develop much deeper networks, much more complicated using some additional tricks. And in doing so, we can essentially start by building relatively primitive features. <clears throat> so when looking at these little pictures, you can interpret the white as positive, the black as negative, and the gray as zero. So we have like kind of a positive bump here, a negative bump here. Um, a lot of them look like that with you know, different orientations of those two bumps. And then we have a couple things that look like you know, just a positive or negative bump. So, um, but using these as building blocks in a later layer, we can put those together and we can get more complicated shapes. And then we can put those together and we can get yet more complicated shapes. And now, you know, as you, as you see, we're starting to get things that look like eyes and noses and so on and, and mouths. And then you can put those together and actually get what look like faces. So the point is that once again, just by cascading these layers that are learning more and more interesting things, you can finally really learn complicated things and, uh, and use them for real world classification problems. Okay, any other, any questions so far? All right. And it turns out this is actually what's going on in our brains more or less. So we have, you could say, different layers of our brain. So uh, <clears throat> scientists who, who study this have actually labeled them as the so-called V1 region, V2 region, V4 region, and so on. And <clears throat> they have done experiments where they have embedded little sensors. So V1 is the visual processing region. They put little sensors on individual neurons and they did experiments to see 
if they could create images that would cause only those little neurons to fire. And what they found are that when they do that, the images look very much like things like this, like little patterns like that or checkerboard patterns or stuff. And that's what really is exciting these very specific neurons. So somehow you could say there is some little neural network, biological neural network that really is going on that's, that's causing us to recognize these little patterns. And then in deeper layers, you know, we're combining those little simple patterns together to get more complicated patterns and so on. And as you go deeper in the brain, you go from more simple stuff to more complicated stuff. And obviously we can do some pretty sophisticated processing when we're through all those layers. <clears throat> all right, so just a little history. First deep networks <clears throat> were in the mid 60s. First convolutional deep networks around 1980. And back propagation in deep networks was people were working on that in the 80s. But in those days, there were a lot of challenges. So first of all, they had very limited training data. And as we know, when you try to build a network with many parameters without much data, you just get overfitting. Also, they had very limited computational power. And there were other structural things they hadn't figured out yet. One of them was this thing called the vanishing gradient problem. The vanishing gradient problem is the issue that you experience if you use sigmoid or tan H in a deep network. So if you think about, let's draw a little picture of what these activations look like. I'll just draw the tan H. Okay. So that's roughly what the tan H looks like. And then it flattens out. And if you think about the gradients, so remember when we, when we do back propagation, we, we, we propagate gradients. So we essentially we like compute a gradient and then that gets multiplied by another gradient which gets multiplied by another gradient and so on. So when we go through an activation layer, okay, the gradient down here is, um, I, think, I think the gradient is one at the origin. But as you get away from the origin, the gradient decreases and pretty soon it gets very small. And so once you get far from the origin in either direction, the gradient is relatively small. And so what happens is when you pass that gradient information back through the network, you know, unless you're always hitting right around zero, the gradient is going to shrink. Every layer you go back is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time you get to the early layers, there's no more gradient to change those parameters. The parameters just kind of get stuck. And this is called the vanishing gradient problem. So this is you know, one of the things that was plaguing people in the early days. Um, but then you know, someone had a nice idea, why don't we use ReLU? Because what ReLU does is it has a gradient of 1 all through this positive region. So the gradient never decreases, right? Yes, there's zero gradient here. So, you know, but, uh, you know, when, when you go through these, these activations, usually you're going through a bunch of them in parallel, and then you're combining them with the weights. So if a few of them are zero, that's not a big deal. You know, even if, if half of them are zero, it's not a big deal. What's important is that you're not attenuating the gradients here. How do you deal with a gradient at zero? Like the... Yes, that's right. There, there is no gradient at exactly at zero. <clears throat> so fortunately, if you think about it, the chance that you'll get exactly zero doesn't really occur because all the, all the inputs, you know, um, Unless, unless, for example, maybe if you, if you put zero in the input to your network, like all zeros. But even then, yeah, so even then what happens is when you initialize the network, you initialize the weights and the biases randomly. So, the, so those bias terms would not be zero, and so even they would prevent you getting exactly zero 
at any point. So, so yes, you're, you're correct to notice that there is an issue, but the chance that you will get exactly zero doesn't often happen. Um, so essentially, that's, that's why it's okay. It still, it still is a bit of an issue in that anytime you do optimization with these discontinuities, the fact that the gradient, like if, if the point moves a tiny bit from left to right and the gradient all of a sudden changes dramatically, that causes the algorithm some, some trouble and that will slow down the algorithm. Um, and so optimizing smooth functions is typically a lot faster than optimizing non-smooth functions. But in any case, this is what's done and it seems to work fine and nobody really complains about the lack of differentiability of the ReLU. <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, so this was one of the breakthroughs that was made, um, you know, roughly 10 years ago is to use these ReLUs, get rid of the sigmoids and that helped incredibly. Um, and then there, was, there were other things we'll talk about, pooling layers, batch norm, dropout, skipping connections. There's all these tricks that have been developed to get around these issues. Um, we'll even, we'll come back to the ReLU. There is, there is a problem that sometimes within your network, you can get certain nodes that are just stuck at zero and they're, they never change from zero. And if that's happening, that node is really not useful. It's not doing anything at all. So there's a slight improvement, very, many different slight improvements on ReLU where maybe you make the slope here 0.01. So it's still working more or less like a ReLU, but there is a positive, there is a small gradient there, so it doesn't get stuck. We'll talk about that later. Okay, any other questions here? All right. All right, so let's spend a little bit more time talking about convolution now. So what we said earlier is that um, the way you can think about, especially the early network layers, is that you're looking for little patterns. So, um, and maybe the, I don't know if the term features is confusing here. I kind of, maybe we should just, because we use features for so many different ways. So maybe we can just say find local patterns, more complex patterns. Okay, just to avoid any confusion. So we're just looking for these little patterns and because, you know, maybe when you look at <clears throat> something like, like an eye, you could say, well, you know, there's this little double bump on the top, double bump on the bottom and so on and so on. And maybe I can build that out of these ingredients. So, um, so essentially that's what we do is we look for these little patterns and then we combine them to get more complex patterns and so on as we go through the network. So then the question becomes, how do we find these little patterns? What is actually the thing we're doing mathematically to, to find them? And, and so that's when we get to uh, convolution or correlation. It's basically pattern matching. Is, is maybe a, a more familiar way of saying it. So here's a little pictorial example. <clears throat> Imagine that I have an image that has a bunch of different uh, digits in it, left to right, up to down, and let's say I'm looking for a four. So one way I could do this is I could make a template of what I think a four is and then I could slide this template around. And where, as I slide it, I take an inner product between the template and the image underneath it. And you know, what is the, remember, what is the image inner product with matrices? It's just a pointwise multiply and sum everything up. So as I move this template around, you know, maybe I move it right here, I see a pretty good match between that four, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And that will cause a big output when I do that inner product. <clears throat> but if I move my template like over here in this white space, you know, very small output, maybe zero output. So, so essentially that's kind of the idea. And we can write that as an equation this way. So 
Okay, so this here is this pattern. This is the template itself. And actually, there's a name for this. This is called the kernel. So we have this template, and let's look at the variables we're using. So k1 and k2 are indexing across the template. Okay, and then we have an image. And the image, let's say we reference the, um, or we have the, let's say the location of the template within the image. Maybe the top left corner, we'll call that point here, um, J1. and J2. Okay, so now hopefully this makes sense. So we're looking at the output at location or at template shift J1 and J2. But to compute that, we have to sum over all these little K1, K2s, but we have to shift the J1 and J2 by different K1, K2s, right? So that's what's going on here. So just trying to explain how we get all this. So this is like our reference point. And then as I move through my template, I have to move K1 and K2 for both the template and the reference. And then I just sum everything up and I'm doing that over the total size of the template, capital K1 and K2. So this is the equation. We're gonna see this stuff a lot. So it's important to really understand what's going on here. Um, otherwise, we'll be confusing later. Okay, any, yeah, question? Um, the J1 and J2, are those, maybe I'll just have a second, are those supposed to be flipped in the diagram? Is the J1 supposed to be speaking across the rows and J2 speaking across the columns? Um, yes, I should, you're right, I should fix that. Swap them. Thank you. This should be J1. And this should be J2. And to be consistent, um, yeah, so K1 going down the rows, K2 across the columns. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So in this specific, if we look at like the, the bottom, I guess, image, that square is describing like J1, J2 in like the top left corner. Uh -huh. And then all the way at the bottom corner is J1 plus capital K1 minus 1 and K J2 plus capital K2 minus 2, like the index, the index position, I suppose? Yes, okay. that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because we're starting, like, this is sort of like the shift within this little box, mm -hmm. and everything is referenced here to J1 and J2. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay. So, great. Another question? Yeah. Is the kernel used to express the template? The kernel is the template, exactly. The kernel, the template, W, those are all the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what the kernel is doing. Okay, great questions. Anything else? All right. So, um, so just now a little bit on terminology. So this, this operation that we just described on the previous page, if you go to the signal processing literature, you'll see this is, def this is what people refer to as two-dimensional correlation. And for example, if you look at the signal processing library in Python, SciPy, it has a function correlate 2D that does exactly this. On the other hand, if you look at the signal processing literature and you say, what is convolution? Convolution is almost identical, except you have negative signs here. So you could say that you're flipping the, the template vertically and horizontally before you slide it around. So if you've taken 5200 or some 
signal processing class, maybe even 3050, um, which talks about convolution. Convolution is always flipping and sliding. And that flipping is manifested, or yeah, that, that's manifested by these negative signs. So really, the difference in correlation and convolution is whether you flip or not. So for that reason, sometimes people um, refer to this as convolution without flipping or convolution with flipping. <clears throat> and it turns out that in machine learning, when people talk about convolution, they're actually talking about correlation or convolution without flipping. So um, convolution does not include flipping and PyTorch and TensorFlow and all those things. So just it could be a little confusing, but, but it's just a matter of definition. Is there any like, reason why we use reasoning like this correlation measure versus just a normal convolution? The correlation is just a little bit simpler. Yeah, and um, yeah, that it's really just it's a little bit simpler, and because yeah, the flipping doesn't really help us at all because we're just going to be learning the Ws anyway, so we'll just be learning the flip thing. So yeah, so I think it's done just to to make it a little simpler. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> So now, there's another important thing to talk about, which is how we handle the boundary conditions when we do this convolution or correlation. So um, let me try to explain these figures a little bit. So the blue here, the blue is the input image. The gray is the kernel. And then this green is the output. Okay, so what we're doing in all these three cases shown here is we're sliding around our, our kernel. We're moving it to different, you know, places. And then when it's centered at a certain point, we're doing a pointwise multiply between its values and the values of the image underneath it. And then we're summing all those together to get the output. So... <clears throat> On the left side, what we're saying is, let's when you know when we hit the boundary, let's not let's not go past the boundary and assume there's anything on the other side of the pixels that we know about. So we know about these 16 image pixels. We're not going to make any assumptions of what's what's around them. So when I do my convolution of a three by three in this four by four, there's actually only four different shifts I can make. There's the one shown there. There's this one. There's this one, and there's this one. There's no other shifts I can do. So as a result, my output image is two by two. And the trouble with that is you might say, well, OK, I've done this convolution, and now I've shrunk my image. And if I keep doing this convolution over and over again, and I keep shrinking my image, it's going to get smaller and smaller, and there's going to be nothing left. So OK, so what's typically done in, in a lot of the signal processing uh, <coughs> classes in literature is you assume that essentially you zero pad. You put zeros all the way around your original image, and you put so many zeros that there's only one point of connection of the kernel in your image. And in this case, it turns out that when you do convolution, the output of the image is actually larger than the input image. Um, I guess it de it's going to depend on the size of the kernel. Basically, here, here's what happens. Like if, if n1 by n2 is the original image size, k1 by k2 is the kernel size, then the output size is going to be given by these different equations in these cases. So <clears throat> probably the most common thing that's done in deep learning is what's called this same mode, where you add just enough zero padding around your input image so that the output has the same size as the input. And this way, as you propagate through the network, you don't have to worry so much about things shrinking or expanding. It just stays the same size unless you change it with you know, some, we'll, we'll talk about pooling layers and stuff later, where we, we explicitly want it to be half as big. Um, so, but we do have to make a choice between these different modes of convolution of how we're going to um, 
handle you know, the boundary conditions. So this is just one of the parameters that you have to tell PyTorch about when you specify the convolutional layer. So in case you want to see an example with actual numbers, um, this, is, this is a convolution of a 3x3 three three kernel and a 5x5 five five image. And this is going to be the valid mode, which is no zero padding. And so as a result, there's a total of nine different shifts. And so our output image is nine. And if you look at what happens here, um, when the kernel is in this position, you just do a pointwise multiply. So three times zero plus three times one plus two times two and so on. And you add up all those and you get 12. And then the next thing is you shift this kernel one pixel to the right, you do those pointwise multiplies, and you get this 12, and so on. So this is just like you know, a very detailed example of how you get all these different numbers through, through convolution. And uh, there's some nice animated GIFs. Let's see if I can get there. Uh, you can see, so this is just showing the kernel moving around and how it generates the, uh, the output pixels. Oops. Okay, there you go. Just a better visualization. All right, so, uh, so I think that's probably a good time to stop. What we'll do next time is we'll actually look at the effect of convolution on a real image and we'll try different kernels, and we'll see how to implement all this in Python. Um, but I think this is a good time to stop now. I think you understand the main points behind convolution. Are there any questions on anything? All right. We'll have a great spring break. And